Hey, I'm going to start with a little math problem today. Um, don't want to cause terror into your hearts too much, but uh, just prime the pump. Okay, here it is. What, what is. what is two plus two? Anybody, what's two plus two? Four. Four is exactly right. Is it always four? Two plus two is always four. In the world of mathematics, it's always four. Now, some have argued that math itself has pointed us to absolute truth. I could argue that way. Uh, at least there are premises, right? Numbers are given values. So that's always true. Now, what about this, this equation? Look at this one. Um, is this always true? Absolutely true. <laughs> Does anybody know what this is? Newtonian, it's, it's the law of gravity. It's the law of gravity. Is it true? It's true here on the planet. Um, if it weren't true, I wouldn't be standing here, right? Um, you wouldn't be sitting where you are. We couldn't make, we couldn't make functional uh, choices in a day. We couldn't watch the masters today without gravity. Praise be to God for gravity. But is it true? Yes. Is it meaningful? Yes. Didn't fully understand it, but now that I understand what it is. How about the most, uh, the best known equation in all, in all the world? What do you think? Okay, how about this one? Yes. What is this? What is E equals MC squared? What is that? The theory of relativity. Exactly. What does that mean? Is it true? Does it have meaning in your life? <laughs> Has something to do with energy equaling mass times the speed of light? No, times two. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't fully understand that. There are a lot of things I don't understand. I don't understand the currents of DC, you know, AC, DC. And I don't understand electricity, but I don't sit around in the dark either. I hit the switch, right? My point is, is this. Some things can be true, and yet we really, you probably haven't thought about the theory of relativity today. Or even the law of gravity. But they are dominating your life. We don't understand a lot of things, and thus we think maybe they don't bring meaning to us, or we don't acknowledge those things. We can do the same with God. Now, the Bible assumes God. In the beginning, God created the world. Now, as I studied apologetics, you know, in my, in my doctoral work, um, it's interesting that the Bible really, there's no, you know, formulaic outline or book that proves the existence of God because, unless, no, all of it does. It's assumed. In fact, the definitive word on atheism in the Bible is Psalm 14.1, that says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Now that's offensive to the atheist, but it means the unthinking person. You haven't brought rational thought to this. You haven't thought this through, is really what that means. Last week we looked at Romans 1, and I've often said, I don't need the Bible. You want to talk about, does God exist? Um, we answered the question last week. You can go and listen to that message. But... I don't need the Bible. And, and Paul kind of outlines this uh, briefly in Romans 1. He does offer an apologetic for the existence of God. Uh, and he would say, um, people, how do you know God exists? Uh, because you do. Because anything does. It's simple cause and effect, right? We've talked about this. It's Arist Aristotelian logic. Thomas Aquinas would, would call God the primary mover, the uncaused cause. That ultimately he created all that is. And you don't get something from nothing. Let's just stay scientific. You don't get living matter from non-living matter. Every kid in here knows this. A rock will not produce a squirrel. Am I right? Dirt will not bring forth a giraffe. God is the one who's created all things, and yet in our world today, we 
tend to think that he's maybe a formula out there, but has no meaning in my life. Though most people are deists and believe, well, some God exists. We've come to believe now in our culture. Uh, someone, someone said, the truth is, there is no truth. I've noted if that statement is true, then it's not true. Talk about that over lunch. Um, you can. The question is, is there, is there absolute truth or is it just the autonomous self? My truth up against your truth. You do you, right? That's the, the mantra of our day. And Paul says if we keep suppressing the truth, that, that's what the atheist is doing, right? Constantly suppressing the truth and exchanging the truth for lies. We're going to look at some lies today. And a little different kind of a sermon today, admittedly, we're going to do some apologetics along the way. I've likened the, um, the atheist to the guy who went out, uh, threw away his old boomerang, about killed himself trying to throw away his old one. <laughs> there is no God. Whoa, 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 a baby's born. What is happening right now? There is no God. <laughs> the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen. Something, there is no God, the eclipse. What is happening right now? Well, the sun is 400 times further away uh, than the moon, and the moon is four, exactly 400 times smaller than the sun. That's what's happening, you get a perfect eclipse. Oh, wow, that is a major coincidence. That's fascinating. <laughs> and all the while, God is just winking at us. And people just in awe and wonder. Some of you saw the pictures. Um, we, we gathered uh, here, different spots along our campus, but we were out front. Uh, some of us were out there, and Cassidy Davis um, took this picture of, of, uh, of the eclipse. How incredible is that? I mean, it got dark. Lights came on. Look, the, the, the clock tower lit up. The clock lit up. It was amazing. I, I took another pic. I took this one. Um, myself look at that we're just out there I mean we're just like and you maybe there are people all over particularly the path of totality just I mean I was amazed what a unifying human experience it was everybody's just what I mean we're just shouting screaming shouting to the Lord how great he is why was that because we long for transcendence we long for something outside of us we're at least in awe or enchanted by it all right but here's what the Bible tells us. I'm setting up this message. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says he's planted eternity in the hearts of men and women. What does that mean? He's planted within you, every single one of us here. Every person on the planet. He has planted within us a homing device. We know he exists. That's why my argument, my argument is uh, there, is no, there is no such thing as an atheist in the world. You're constantly suppressing the truth. However, Paul tells us in Romans 1, you do that long enough, and God will say, okay, you want to live as if I don't exist? Have at it. Let's see how that goes. And we're seeing that played out in spades. And to the degree that we do that, we see it played out. And the natural, if you will, consequences of our sin. But even that's in view of redemption. The Lord says, life without me, let's see how that goes, so that you'll be drawn back to me. And his love is drawing us to him even today, friend. Don't miss this. There is something beyond what we see and what you're hearing. God and his spirit is in our midst because we are here together and he's speaking into every heart here. And if you don't know the Lord, today is your day. That's why he brought you here. And I want you to turn to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, we're going to look at verses 15 through 23. Everybody turn in your Bible. You have one in front of you there. Always want us to be in the word. I know we show you the scripture here and I'll jump around a little bit. Um, admittedly, a different kind of sermon today. So uh, we're always exegetical or expository in our preaching. But today I'm going to launch into... Um, uh, three philosophies, if you will. I think this, this text speaks to it. Three philosophies or ideologies that, that people run to to find truth, to find absolute truth. And we're going we're gonna to point out the fact that Jesus is greater and why he's greater 
than secularism, why he's greater than relativism, or did you hear, why he's greater than pluralism. A quick Google search tells me there are 234 isms <laughs> in the world, um, and they're all philosophies or political moral belief systems. The suffix ism makes a noun a practice. One writer said, a religion. And so, though Paul doesn't use these words, I want to unpack it this way because we talk a lot about sexism or nationalism or racism, humanism, um, even today, atheism. Colossians 1 is one of the most theologically dense passages in all of Scripture, this, this passage. It is, one theologian said, it is nosebleed theology. This is Christology at, at its best, an understanding of the nature of Christ. Uh, it seems that it, some think it might be an early hymn or that Paul is just riffing on, on his own thoughts, let, guided by the Spirit. Um, and I, I tend to think that this is him, just writing what is coming to him. But it plays out in three stanzas, essentially. And that's how we're going to break it down. So first... Jesus is greater than secularism. I want to spend most of our time here. Secularism, you might know, we'll have to define the terms along the way. It's non-spiritual, okay, not religious. A secular person would say there's no place for religion in, in my life. Um, they might say their spirit, like the eclipse was a spiritual experience. But really what they mean is within them, that was, that was all inspiring. It was wonderful. But that's it. And it ends there. Uh, for a lot of Christians, secular is, is kind of a cuss word, but it basically just means life functioning apart from religion, religious institutions and such. And much of what we love and enjoy in our country today, um, some would say in a secular democracy or liberal democracy, is the fact that we, have, we, we, we do have a place for different religions. And, uh, but, but the secularists would say, I have nothing to do with religion. Jesus is greater than secularism, but how might even that truth be applied? Look at verse 15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. For by him, listen to this, many of you have heard this passage, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. That pretty much covers everything, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, hierarchies of all kinds all around us, all things were created through him. And check this, for him. And he is a before all things, and in him all things are held together. All things hold together in him. Now, if, if you, maybe this is new to you, this passage, and you're thinking, wow, I thought Jesus just kind of showed up for a minute, died on the cross for our sins, and now we can go to heaven. There's something more going on here. Jesus is greater, Paul is saying, than we can ever get our minds around. Jesus is greater than secularism because he has come to show us there is a God. Many people turn to empiricism or secularism because it's tangible. You can say it works. We can measure it. Jesus comes, tangible, in the flesh and shows us, Jeff, how do you know God exists? Because you do. That's enough, because anything does. But watch this, because he came here and told us that he exists. How do you know what God is like? Look at Jesus. He is the exact representation of God in the flesh. I've said it before, we don't look at Muhammad to see who God is. We don't look at Buddha to figure out who God is. We, we, don't, look at, we don't look at Confucius or, or anybody else. We look at Jesus because he is God in the flesh. And look at this. There, there's this. Uh, he's a firstborn. This doesn't mean that he was, he was, yes, he was born incarnate. But this means all rights and privileges, authority of the firstborn. There's a hierarchy here. He's preeminent above all things. Jesus is greater than secularism because he transcends it all and he shows us that there is this intersection of the secular and the spiritual. Secularism, you could say, is founded on really three principles. I've noted the government must be separated from the influence of religion. 
Inst- religious institutions. This gets dicey, doesn't it? Um, secondly, that everyone has the right to freedom of religion. Let me say yes, yes, and yes. And all religions are treated as equal. And so I think most of us, particularly Baptists, I don't even know this, if you're not a Baptist or don't know Baptist history, we have been on the forefront of religious liberty, religious freedom, and the separation of church and state. Because we were the ones, among others, who were persecuted. Our country was founded on this fact, that there's a separation between church and state. But watch this. Don't miss this. Jesus is greater than secularism because he transcends the secular sacred divide. There is no compartmentalism in Jesus Christ. He is the one. The secular, non-spiritual, secular life doesn't work in, for many reasons, but we see this played out. A, a secular person in an effort to rid all of, you know, put religion aside... They simply adopt politics or something else as their religion. Because we're going to worship something. And we're seeing this in our day. Many people have adopted, how else are you going to change the world? Politics. That's how we're going to do it. And the, the Christian knows, okay, yes, an integrated, holistic, comprehensive life in Jesus means wherever I show up, I'm bringing the kingdom of God. In whatever arena I find myself in, secularism doesn't work because you can't remove Jesus from any aspect of your life. And yet, here's the challenge. I think we all do this to some degree. And this is one of the great take-homes I want you to really take home with you. Jesus is greater because he transcends the secular sacred divide. How do you compartmentalize your life? As if some is sacred and some is, is not. You know, our founding fathers said that all men are created equal. There's a creator and that we have inalienable rights. That's personally owned or possessed rights. God-given rights. Where did that come from? Not the Enlightenment. That's not Locke. That's not Hume. It's not even Jefferson. That's Genesis 1. And so what's fascinating in our day, I'm seeing this, Secularist thinkers are now coming to admit popular secularist thinkers, even atheists, are saying, you know, there's a lot of good in that Christian stuff. Don't believe it, but everything that's right and good, particularly in the global West, but this is true all over the world, uh, it has its foundation in Judeo-Christian values and beliefs. They can't get away from it. Uh, Last week, in fact, If you follow any of this, this is the world I live in. Famous atheist Richard Dawkins, who wrote a book called The God Delusion, he came out and said and shocked the world of philosophers and others. He was an angry atheist, by the way, uh, still. And he calls himself a cultural Christian last week. Made big news. What he means is he doesn't believe in Jesus. He's like Tom Holland, a secular atheist historian, who says he's a Christian atheist. And what he means is his history tells him that if you live where I live, um, you're living in a Christian world. Whether you acknowledge it or not, even Jordan Peterson, some of you know that name, he is going around talking about God and the power of of the Bible, and he's not yet a believer, though I think he's on a journey. He would say Christianity is metaphorically true, it's allegorically true, but it's not historically true. Paul is saying, and scripture teaches us, as does history. No, no, no. Jesus came historically. He was God in the flesh. And he is the answer to it all. But these guys can't quite cross the line, and maybe you're here today, because you have compartmentalized the secular And the sacred can never be intertwined. They never intersect. Watch this. Eliminate the answer before you start the equation. And it leads to absurdity. Let's say there is no number four. Okay? Kids, help me out. There's no number four. What is two plus two? 
As no number four. Sorry. In my little world. What is it then? Three plus one. Could be six minus four. Could be 3.99. No, that didn't work. Could be five. It's not five. The point being, you eliminate the, the answer before you start the equation, at least to absurdity. So in the 1800s, what comes along, Nietzsche, among other philosophers, claimed that God is dead. There is no, no need for God anymore. God has died in our, in our cultures. He's, he's no longer a part of the equation. They come to the great questions of life, questions of origin, purpose, and destiny. Where did we come from? There is no God. Let's start there. So, let's solve the equation. We came from nothing? Ludicrous. We kind of evolved from some form of algae that became something. One book was from the goo to the zoo to you. <laughs> Literally. Absurdity. You remove the truth of God and his word and what we already know and it always leads to absurdity. What's the purpose of life? Well, there is no God. So, hmm, let's talk about it. And every thoughtful atheist has come to the same conclusion. There's no purpose. Jean-Paul Sartre, the great uh, French philosopher, <laughs> wrote a book on life without God, essentially as an existentialist. The title of the book, Nausea. <laughs> title of his book. The revulsion of life without God. Every honest atheist has gotten there and says there is no meaning. And I'm fascinated by what's happening in our culture today. The secular story is not working, and everybody knows it. So, people are open to the gospel, friends. I'm telling you they are. But here's the challenge for us as Christians today. We tend to divide the sacred and the, and, and the secular. You look in the Bible, and you look for the word spiritual in the Old Testament, and you don't find it. Through Genesis to Malachi, the book that Jesus read, the Bible Jesus read. You don't see it much in the New Testament, though Paul goes there. Why is it not in the Bible? Or in the Old Testament in particular. Because in the Hebraic mind, listen, in, the, in Hebrew thought, everything is spiritual. Everything. This dualistic approach to life, and yes, even Christianity, is much more of a Western post-Hebraic, more of a Greek kind of way of thinking. Jesus completely integrated life, seamless, holistic, comprehensive, everything is spiritual. There is no secular spiritual divide. And here's how this plays out. Watch this. If you do this in your own life, much of your life, could it be this is why you're feeling it, much of your life is meaningless if you go that route because isn't it true much of life is trying to get up tomorrow go to work go to school do the math problems try to learn change diapers care for preschoolers work hard get home rest go out to eat yes get Long, you know, go to the grocery store. Isn't that most of life? If you, div if you think that's not holy and sacred, no wonder much of your life seems meaningless. Dualism is not a part of the Christian life. We do not compartmentalize God. We invite Jesus into every aspect of our lives. How do you compartmentalize God? That's worth thinking about. It might be that you go the way of the atheist at times. My life has no meaning. I don't find purpose in what I'm doing because you have redefined the equation. This is why I think that the word Christian makes a great noun but a lousy adjective. I'm a Christian businessman, businesswoman. I get that. That's good. I get it. Aren't you a Christian? Christian? <laughs> 
I'm a Christian musician. Wait, okay. So you're a Christian when you do that thing. We were, Stacy and I were with our graduates last week. We we're with our student ministry and we're launching our graduates, you know, in, or our seniors now, launching them into the world. So we were there and uh, with others doing some teaching and had a great time with, with uh, our graduates and parents. And what we told them, a part of what we were talking about was, listen, you are a Christian first who happens to be a college student, right? Wherever you go, you are a Christian. Now, we did make this point with the parents and students in the room. Wherever you go, here in Dallas or whatever campus you step on, whatever town you're moving to, you're going there because you're a student. And the parents said amen. Um, but you're a Christian, not compartmentalizing your life. You're going as a witness. You're being commissioned. This is true for all of us, friends. Everywhere you go this week. When Paul talks about spiritual, he's talking about those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Those of us who are believers. When we step into that space, we're bringing the presence of God. Now you could argue he's already there, but the Christian life is 24-7, whatever you're doing, and all the time. And this should set us free. And we are praying as a church. I want you to hear this. A lot of people are concerned about secularism in our schools, in, in our public schools, in our culture. We are praying for our schools. And you can join us. We're praying for five districts, an initiative that we've just launched. You can go to our website or learn more about it from, from any of us on staff. But you can go to our website, find our prayer initiative, be praying for schools in your area. We're doing that now in our dwell reading. You did it on Saturday if you're walking with us. But Jesus is greater than secularism because he transcends it all. All right? Now, quicker on these final two points. Jesus is greater than relativism. You might know that relativism is, well, there's no truth. You do you. There's no objective right or wrong. We see this in our culture today. Look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. Now, we have this final apologetic, which is the church. A people showing the world what the kingdom of God looks like. As we love each other, we love others in mob form. We go forth and we show the world that Jesus is the one. A relative view is your own view. You do you, I do me. There's no ultimate reality. But the, but the head of the body is the church, of the church is Christ. He is the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead. Meaning he is the first installment of a new resurrection to follow, that in everything he might be preeminent. He's supreme and above all. Then he qualifies it. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. So this is what he's up to, to reconcile to himself, make all things right in the world. That's what he's up to. He's making all things right, whether on heaven or on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross, which is right at the center of this intersection of the secular sacred. Relativism doesn't work because Jesus defines truth. Now, this again is, is fascinating. Truth is defined in a person. How else would we know what it looks like? Well, we could put up an equation. We could put some, somebody could come up with it. Nope. It's in the person of Jesus. We know exactly what truth is, is because we look at Jesus. Jesus himself said he was the way, he's the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. One of the questions we received on social media was this. Does God want me to be happy? And that's a good question. The quick answer is yes. But we've talked about this recently. Um, relativism would say, he wants me to be happy, so whatever I want to do that would make me happy would be really good. So I'm going to do that based on pleasure or whatever I want to do. You see, here's the point. Relativism is relative, relate, you hear the word there. Relativism is relative to me. Relativism finds its center in me and what I think is right and wrong. And, and that's the problem in our world today. And yet the Bible tells us that God is the word in the flesh. Now I want us to jump to this last point 
as we close our time together, Jesus is greater than pluralism. He's greater than pluralism. A pluralistic society is not bad in and of itself. In fact, uh, a democracy, a liberal democracy is going to have pluralism. People who believe different things, different traditions, and we all work together to get along, right? So we live in a democracy, and so it's a pluralistic society. And I think we can all say, well, praise the Lord for that. The problem is religious pluralism asserts that truth cannot be known in maybe no religion or certainly not in any singular one religion. This is popular in our day. Some of you have seen this bumper sticker that, that really helps explain what I'm talking about here. Um, anybody seen this? We've seen this? Um, coexists. So each of the letters, you know, it, it represents a major world religion in, in our day. Uh, now, if that just means, um, if that just means let's all get along, then we'd be like, yes, let's love each other. And by the way, as Christians, <laughs> we will out love everybody. That's our witness. That's the final apologetic. Watch us outgrace you. Watch us dominate you with love. That's the witness, right? But, but if it means instead, all religions teach the same thing. And that's really what it means. That's, that's the essence behind that message. If you think that all religions teach the same thing and they're all equal, which is you know, pure pluralism, you have not studied comparative religions at all. They do not teach the same thing by a long shot. Islam teaches that you can uh, follow the five pillars of Islam. There is no, Jesus is a prophet. There's no triune God. You just do your best. And even there, the certainty of heaven is not yours. There's not a triune God. There's no, you know, none of this out of Colossians 1. Buddhism would say there is essentially no God. That life is a blowing out of all desire. That's your problem. And you need to follow the eightfold path of Buddhism to get there. Hinduism, 330 million gods. And we're all essentially deity because we are being reincarnated based on how we live our lives. All of these religions are just that, trying to get to God through our own efforts. And the irony of someone saying that all religions teach the same thing is, I would come back to say, or, or that you don't find truth in any one religion. I say, well, what do you, what do, you do? Well, I, I mean, I just choose the best from all of them. That's how we ought to live. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Who, who decides what's best? <laughs> See where that goes? You are the final authority. Oh, you're the God of your religion. That's what you've come to. And, and to say there is no truth is the most prideful, exclusive truth claim you could possibly make. You see, the irony of it, most of us haven't thought through this. Jesus is greater than secularism because he transcends it all. He, he bridges the gap. There is no divide. All is spiritual. All is sacred. He's greater than relativism because he is the truth. And he's greater than pluralism because he stands above it all. And he alone is the way to the Father, not through good works. He alone has come to make a way for us. So it's not about how good we are. It's not about how smart we are. He's come to rescue us. Because sin is not simply bad behavior up against good behavior. Sin is a condition of the heart. And we need rescue. And we all know it. So in verse 21, as we close, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, friends, in the real historical Jesus in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. Only Jesus can present us holy and blameless. It will not happen through any other religion, any other belief, any other ism. But the challenge we face in our day is this. With relativism and pluralism, if you don't agree with me, then that's unloving. Anybody seen this? You disagree with me, then you must hate me. 
No, 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 no. Here's what's behind that. Truth sounds like hate for those who hate the truth. And we suppress the truth. We push against. Why do we hate the truth? Because it confronts me in my sin. Because God wants me to live beyond all of my garbage. So he comes and he rescues us so that we can be presented to him blameless and pure, holy before God, totally forgiven so that we can live our lives before him. And then Paul says in verse 23, we'll close with this, if indeed you continue in the faith, what's he mean? You press on. This is a good word for us today with all that's happening in our world. Prove that you belong to him, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, in which now I, Paul, became a minister, in which now you, disciple of Jesus, have become a minister in the world to show the world secularism doesn't work. Relativism is not the answer. Pluralism in its purest form is not the answer. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Praise be to God. Let's pray together. So friend, let me guide you uh, before we close our time and then we'll sing uh, glory to God, the doxology as we head out today into this glorious day. Now, maybe the most, one of the most important moments of, of your week right now. Maybe of your life. Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you come to the end of yourself? Trying to justify yourself. Perhaps today the spirit has broken down barriers that you've had to faith and it's time for you to say yes. God's been waiting on you. With all the options how do you choose? Friends, pick the one who came and showed us who God is. Pick the one who died on the cross for your sin. Pick the one who wrote himself into our story so that we might be presented holy and blameless before him. Praise be to God. Give your life to him now. He is the irresistible gravitational force that's drawing you to himself. Lord, we love you. We give you our lives because it is the only right and logical spiritual thing to do. Thank you for speaking to us through your word. May we exalt you, bring glory to you, and worship you every minute every second of our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.